Hello, nerds for Yang. Hello, nerds. 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 Hello, Hello, nerds. <laughs> Richard Thrip from the great state of Florida. A lot of action going on in your, your neck of the woods. How you doing? I'm pretty good. I've been working a lot in the campaign. It's been pretty exciting. Yeah, I live in uh, Volusia County, not too far from Orlando. Well, you know, my mom is currently in the Orlando area. And uh, she's a little concerned about all this Corona stuff going on. Uh, how is it like living in Florida? Because I think Florida was one of those states that uh, reopened uh, on the earlier side and seems to be kind of reaping the yeah, impact. Of that. It did not go well. Yeah, <laughs> the Florida yeah. government is run by Republicans and they followed what Trump said and it didn't work out well at all. Um, now we're kind of the, the epicenter, you know, we're probably going to pass California even eventually we passed Florida. Uh, the sheriff in our County just came down with coronavirus, and he was mm. actually just at a sheriff's conference and people from that conference were with Donald Trump recently. So, you know, it's spreading very bad, very badly. We've had people pass away. I know people with coronavirus. Um, you know, some of them are, are having, mild cases and then some are feeling really sick yeah and we have a tropical storm bearing down on us at the moment yeah seriously you guys um, yeah. are going through a lot uh i hope it i hope i hope you guys can make it through that okay it seems like you, you're gonna have a lot of challenges and then you're probably gonna have a pretty intense debate over your ballots i'm guessing maybe yeah, well, it could be. We've been really in this county. We're blessed with supervisor of elections does a great job and the other counties in the district, too. So mail in voting works well here, mm. uh, unlike the rhetoric of, from the president. And so we've had oh, probably 20, 25,000 ballots already cast just in the Democratic primary that I'm running in on August 18th. And people get their ballots in, in early July, like July 14th mm. in advance. And for, for November 3rd, people will be getting their ballots by mail at the end of September. So it's very early and you can track it on their website on um, Supervisor of Elections. Yeah, it works well. Um, so I, I guess I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, Richard Thrip. I am running for Congress as a progressive Democrat supporting Medicare for all UBI and a green new deal here in Florida sixth district, which is um, Daytona beach, the world's most famous beach and uh, Deltona, the land, Palm coast, New Smyrna beach. Very nice area. You know, we have a lot of, a lot of people left behind though, economically. So tell us a little bit about who Richard Thrip was before he started running uh, for office. Yeah, well, some of you may have heard that I'm a recovered Republican. I, I used to buy into a lot of stuff that I don't anymore. And for me, learning about climate change, learning about how our economy, you know, isn't working for anyone except at the top helped to change my mind. I'm also a father and I'm a PhD in education, published author. Here's one of my books, um, which actually became a lot more relevant now. I was the third editor on it, edited every chapter, a lot of work. Um, so I finished my PhD at University of Central Florida, and I, I taught technology to future teachers and studied financial literacy, financial regulation, investing, you know, what people know about it. They don't know a whole lot. And so I see that as being a big issue that we need financial education and financial regulation to protect consumers. Uh, so I graduated in December of last year after uh, many years, seven years plus at the night. Uh, at UCF and decided to run for Congress uh, with my wife's blessing, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far, you know, it's been really picking up steam in the past couple months. Yeah, you are, uh, as, as someone who has a doctorate in uh, education technology, that's, I mean, I was literally just in a meeting this morning with my kids, some, some parents from my kids' school talking about, like, you know, how are we going to... Um, handle the school year starting in the fall and you know how are we going to do remote learning in an effective way uh it, are there things that you think 
the federal government can or should do, or or should this be really handled at the local level? Oh, I think it should be both, and I think there should be big federal funding for it. I mean, you look, a lot of times the states are uh, they're left to fund all the essential services on their own. And so then you see all these disparities when it comes to property tax revenues in different areas. In our county, we tend to be a donor county to other counties in Florida. Uh, so I, I think there's a big role for federal funding. If we have federal funds for top corporations and the ultra wealthy, how, how come we don't have it for our kids and for remote learning and for, there's a lot of infrastructure you need. You can't just put something, some slides online and call it a day. And mm -hmm. here we've seen uh, Governor Ron DeSantis, who's actually the former Congressman for the district I'm running in, has taken away funding for online learning, but at the same time is giving $543 million back to top Florida corporations and $738 million to fund these terrible toll roads that only are supported by paving companies in uh, rural areas of Florida, you know, what's left of the wildlife corridor they want to take away. Yeah, it's um, certainly there doesn't seem to be a shortage of federal money going to places. I guess the, the question is, where is it going, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. And what is your, um, someone in the audience was asking, uh, oh, is, is Richard Yang Gang, do you identify with the Yang Gang? <laughs> oh, I, I do. I uh, Some people have uh, criticized, like, uh, you're not talking enough about UBI, but I talk about UBI all the time. I started supporting it early in my campaign. I began to run in uh, January 1st of this year, and by February, I come on board for Medicare for All and UBI, and the Green New Deal was the first issue because I was so, you know, I'm so concerned as a father and a young person about the climate, but I never looked back, and I was on board before coronavirus hit. You know, so mm. now it's become so much more apparent. Uh, but yeah, we want to get endorsed. We're trying to, I put, I, I signed the Humanity Floor Pledge on April 15th. So I've been like emailing left and right, tweeting at them, getting our volunteers to try to get some attention on this race. Uh, I know Adam Christensen was just endorsed in CD3, which is a good district too. But over here, people haven't really looked at it as much. And we're actually, you know, a more competitive district in terms of Republicans versus Democrats. Uh, and, and the guy who's in now is a total joke. I mean, he's a Trump shill, basically, and he doesn't live in the district. He always calls it North Florida. We don't, we call it Central Florida where we live. <laughs> How long has he been? Uh, has he been there for a while or what's his, no, what's that's his, his first term? He's a freshman. <laughs> he ah. replaced the governor. So the governor, he was a three term ah. congressman for here. And uh, then he became governor barely and and then this guy came in from jacksonville and there was a great democrat running but it just didn't work as well as she expected ambassador nancy soderberg ended up losing by 13 percentage points and she you know was a tremendous fundraiser very good credentials you know i can't claim they've worked for bill clinton and for barack obama and and for um ted kennedy but nevertheless i think that we need young leadership in Congress. And so I saw, you know, the race here was basically wide open because I, I do have a primary, but the man I'm running against always got a sign. He's raised $400 last quarter. Uh, we raised more than that last week. And, you know, we have a big movement coming with volunteers canvassing. We sent 37,000 text messages. We just got endorsed by Our Revolution Florida today. Uh, and we're trying to get our revolution national to endorse. We're endorsed by Florida for Bernie too. So it's a coalition of of, of, of Yang and, and Bernie supporters and Biden supporters too. And I think that's what you need in this district. You have to have unity and uh, you know, we can get a lot done. Even just by running, we're getting a lot done. We're moving the needle. Uh, and then we've got local candidates running too for state legislature. Some of them right out of college and they're doing a great job in seats that are usually not contested. Usually these Republicans, you know, sometimes there's not even an opponent, but we're giving them a big fight. And uh, I think this is a year that's going to be, although it's a very tragic year, it's going to be a big catalyst for change, I hope. It seems to be going that way. Yeah, I would not be surprised if there's a huge um, tidal wave of change uh, come November 3rd, just because people are so fed up with the status quo. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there will probably be a lot of uh, district surprises. 
and maybe uh, Florida Six would be one of them. What, what do you think are the issues that are of most importance to your prospective constituents? Oh, well, here the average voter is about 59 years old. So a lot of people are very concerned about coronavirus and they're very concerned about um, Social Security. I would say that Donald Trump wants to abolish Social Security. If you talk about we need to cut payroll taxes to 0% instead of, you know, 12.4% for Social Security, then that's starving the beast. You're going to get rid of it for people. Uh, with UBI, we have a bit of an issue because we tend to believe that people don't like it here based on polling. And, and, and so we, and we have it on our website, but we push more about universal health care, expanding Medicaid, expanding um, Social Security and protecting it and our environment. Because anyone who's here who, who has a rational you know, view of things knows that the environment and the greenhouse gas emissions and the climate crisis and all of it are water in Florida, huge issue. And you know that in San Francisco as well. Uh, you guys have the fires and mm -hmm. I, I know San Francisco really well. My mother actually works there and, and lives out there. So I, I've been there many times, beautiful city, very uh, too expensive to, to live there. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not the cheapest city around. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the, I have relatives also in Australia who are dealing with fires down there. And then now my mom's in Florida and, she's seeing these hurricanes and everything. It's, it just does seem like the earth is trying to tell us something. Oh, and, it is. Uh, and, and, you know, we have 3 billion people in, in 20, um, 1960, and now we have almost 8 billion. And if you look at the past, like 35 or so years, yeah. more greenhouse gas emissions from humans than the rest of human history before like 1980, that's yeah. just a huge, a great acceleration that uh, we have to change it. It's already a lot of it's baked in, but we have a choice. Do we want the future to be hell on earth or do we want it to be pretty bad, but you know, livable? Now, if I were to play devil's advocate with you, what I have heard uh, a lot of the Trump Republicans argue when people talk about climate changes, you know, the world's climate has changed for thousands of years. Um, it'll continue to change. And um, if we if we implement the climate change mitigations that some people are talking about, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to have cars or air conditioners and, you know, we'll get cancer from windmills and all this. Kind of crazy <laughs> yeah. Stuff, right. I, well, I, how I do you respond to that? Yeah, I, I play devil's advocate harder on myself than anybody else does on me. So what I usually say to that is, well, for, firstly, we've never had the Earth go from 280 to 417 parts per million of CO2 this quickly. The last time it was this high was probably about 3 million years ago. The oceans were way higher, like many, many feet higher, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't want to have lived on that Earth. I, I would also say about how there's big, big subsidies at all levels for f failing fossil fuels. The fossil fuel deal is just not working for the American people or for humanity. And so you see like when a fracking well um, goes up, they get all this cheap, easy credit. You know, it's debt financed, it, it's poisoning the water. They get natural gas comes out as a byproduct that they don't even want because it's not worth anything. So they burn it off as it comes out. So it's like triple as bad as a conventional oil well. Uh, and, and so you look here that the oceans are hotter, they're more acidic. You know, when when Michael came and hit the panhandle, uh, it was actually forecast to be a tropical storm a few days before. It ended up being a category five. So, you know, we've always had bad hurricanes, but now, you know, you're seeing more of them and they're getting worse because of the warming effect. Uh, so you can talk to people who are Republicans, farmers in the Midwest, and they say, we never seen anything like this when it comes to the floods that just won't stop the rain. You know, the growing season is ruined, crops. Um, and then for Australia, too, those fires should not have been that bad. They shouldn't have. And, and you've got the same problem that the government of Australia is bought and paid for by coal. So they're telling people, oh, it's, mm. not, uh, it's not a real problem, but it's just rejecting reality this is a chart from um this is not from some left-wing organization yeah. this is from nasa the, this the is actually ice. the u.s government science 
And it does show that the parts per million of CO2, I suppose you could argue they've been going up slightly over you know, the last thousands of years, but certainly there appears to be a sudden change after 1950. Uh-huh. That's hard to ignore. Yeah. Um, but you know, the other argument I've heard from people on the other side of the aisle is they may say, well, look, Tom, maybe you're right, but uh, we need to be energy independent. This natural gas that we're getting is a, a gift from God that gives us uh, independence from Middle Eastern oil. So, you know, why would you go against the first time that we've become an energy exporter um, for maybe something that happens to some polar bears down the road? Well, it's not happening down the road. It's happening right now. A lot of this stuff needs to stay in the ground. Like when you look, you, you can't use all of it. it. It's already too much of a disaster. And, you know, as, as for importing oil, I mean, Warren Buffett says, well, well why would you want to be energy independent? It'd be like saying that I want to be able to print books at home. I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> I got to be able to make these at home. I need a printing press. It's like, uh, really? But we do have great resources. You know, the United States has great natural resources. People who are, you know, we're so hardworking, generous, in, uh, ingenious. So I think we need to be global leaders. Often another thing you'll hear is, oh, India and China and Russia, mm -hmm. you're not going to stop them. So what difference is it going to make? Well, you know, we invent stuff all the time and it spreads all over the world. Like the internet, you know, we, we, we've done so much and we can do so much better. Uh, I think coronavirus, there's some downsides uh, environmentally. Now we're doing more, you know, disposable plastics. But at the same time, we've seen a lot of people, especially in San Francisco, but maybe not as much in my district because people who are able to work from home before they were told, oh, you can't work from home. You got to come to the office. And now mm -hmm. it's like, ah, it turns out you could work from home. <laughs> and it's yeah. the same with cruises. Like who knew that cruises were not necessary? <laughs> and air travel <laughs> cruises put out a lot of dirty uh fumes because they use you know cheaper dirty fuel and it wouldn't be that cheap if you are pricing in the negative externalities you know economists talk about that are imposed on other people and, and nature and our children and people right now i mean we have climate refugees right here uh from puerto rico who came here after hurricane maria you know, so people often will act like it's in the distant future, but it is not. And it's happening right now, happening to someone, you know, probably. Let's talk a little bit about education. I noticed it's one of the first things you talk about on your website around uh, yes. the policies. You know, one of the arguments um, I've heard is that the U.S. and I've seen data suggesting that the U.S. spends plenty per student on education. And so I'm curious, how do you respond to the argument that like, well, why should we put more money in? It's clearly something's not working. It's an efficiency problem. It's not a funding problem. I think it's a funding problem too. I, I've read those papers, but I've read other ones that say, actually, we, we don't, if you calculate it correctly, that we, we don't spend as much on education as we used to, or, or as you'd think when you hear those sorts of arguments. I just think a lot of it is actually um, inequitably distributed. So I, I was listening to a podcast with uh, the NEA president and mm -hmm. National Educators Association, and she said, well, some of these, you know, the, 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 the better quote unquote schools have money to send their their students on field trips to France or you know to do stuff that the other st students don't get to do in other schools she said I wouldn't take away that from anyone I just wish everyone had the opportunity which of course is a bit rosier than we probably could do but looking for me I did my PhD dissertation on uh, pre-service teachers, so they're getting their bachelor's in elementary ed to be a teacher, and looking at the Florida retirement system and what they know about uh, personal finance and about that system, there was a big cut here in Florida to the retirement system. In 2011, they added a 3% payroll deduction. It used to be zero. They got rid of the um, cost of living adjustment, went from 3% earned per year to zero. Uh, and they also, there were so many changes that were unfavorable it was a huge cut to compensation to teachers. But you know, you don't see that when you look at salaries. It's like, oh, they're still making 38,000 mm -hmm. a year to start. So that didn't change. 
No, it, it really did change. And so when you look at our, our kids as well, you see a lot of um, disparities in Volusia County. We have about 70 public schools, about two thirds are, um, are Title I, meaning they have many students uh, who are from lower income families receiving free and reduced price lunches. We always use that as a proxy because it's uh, easy data to get at. So I, I think in Congress, we could do a better job of advocating for better Title I funding. You know, really, we don't want unfunded mandates. And we have these in not just education, but when we said, you know, some people complain about the lockdown for coronavirus. And I sympathize, it was an unfunded mandate for so many people. In Florida, we still we still have people who haven't got any unemployment. They even though it was just ending the six hundred dollars uh, supplement, there's people who are owed like ten thousand dollars plus who lost their homes already and are living out of their cars. Uh, the the system in Florida is probably it's probably dead last. It's just horrible for getting unemployment. It was made that way on purpose. The computer website so that people couldn't get it. Uh, which has been effective in the past at reducing unemployment insurance premiums. You have uh, Rick Scott to thank for that. And now he's senator, so it's like he loves to tell people, uh, "You people are lazy. You need to be working more." But it's ridiculous, you know. And I think that's a big problem we have. We always look at like people around us, but we don't tend to look up the chain in our economy to see where the money, the great sucking sound, I think as Ross Perot called it. I know I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but you know, education is very important and money is not everything to education, but you still, you have, you have people buying supplies for their students as teachers, you know, and you think, well, why, why don't we use the, the bargaining power that the state should have to get those supplies for them. Uh, I, I hear all the time, I have not heard a teacher and I ask them this question, do you work under 40 hours a week or, or more than 40? Never, nobody ever says under 40 hours a week. <laughs> you know, they're doing mm -hmm. lesson plans, they're doing more, they're expected to do more and more with less and less. And they've had, you know, online teaching foisted on them. And at the same time in Florida, they're being pushed to go back to school in person without the proper precautions when it's unsafe to do so. I mean, there was just a school board meeting here where it went to one in the morning because there were that there were four hours of, of comments from people saying you can't send you know teachers and, and, and kids back to school during the the probably apex of a pandemic. Yeah, it's uh that's a real hard one, right? You you want the kids to get the benefit of in-person education and some of the, uh, I, I was listening to the Fauci testimony uh, a couple of days ago and, you know, they were talking about there's a real cost to keeping kids mm -hmm. from school. At the same time, if, if my wife were a teacher, I would be like, whoa, well, what are they doing to protect you? Uh, yeah. And it feels like we're very eager to get the kids back in there, but I, I haven't heard as much of a plan to keep everyone safe. No, and you haven't when it comes to senior citizens either. You'll hear them saying, "We well, can get back to work, and then we'll keep the we'll keep grandma in the clo you know, like in the closet or in, a, mm -hmm. in her mother in law unit. She'll be fine." There, there's no evidence to support this. Like the virus, people live together, they see their family, they have caregivers and you know medical professionals in contact. And so we we just had a 71 year old woman who who was a, a civil a civil rights uh, leader. In, in Daytona Beach passed away of coronavirus. You know, Herman Cain just died of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. We, we have teachers writing wills because they, I mean, everyone should have a will, of course, but, you know, they're, they're, they're updating their will or writing it for the first time because that's something that could happen. It, it's a better chance in winning the lottery for sure, but better chance of being killed in a car accident. We heard endlessly, oh, it kills fewer people than the flu. Oh, the car, you know, that's more dangerous. Well, there's about 100 people die a day on average in the U.S. from, from motor vehicle accidents. We had 257 people die just in Florida of coronavirus a couple of days ago in one day. Mm hmm but they yeah. just keep moving the goalposts. Uh, it's just, it's unbelievable. How can you be pro-life and before you know sending people off to die when it comes to coronavirus I, I don't get it 
we we there. politicize something it shouldn't be, and I'm sorry to keep talking over you. I'll let you go. <laughs> no, no, it's okay, man. There, uh, I I agree. The the inconsistencies in some of these positions is very confounding, but also like it's kind of the new normal in the Trump Republican world. Like it, it's very common to see people say we're going to cancel the political convention for safety, and then literally in the same breath say, but all schools must reopen. So um, that's just is what it is. W what are your thoughts, Richard, on um, convincing your constituency? You said the average age is 59. Uh, those are folks that historically, at least from the Yang campaign, had the least support for Yang and were most suspicious of UBI. Yes. And I, I, I know this uh, from many conversations with my mom, who is uh, well past retirement and, you know, kind of living on Social Security and support from the family. I've tried to convince her, like, hey, if Andrew Yang got elected, you, you'd you be in a way better position, mom. You, you'd have like a, a floor that you wouldn't have to worry about. And, you know, she's very... Um, old fashioned and, and kind of old school. And it's like, well, you know, people should, should work for their money. And I'm curious, like, have you found a way to convince more older voters to be open to basic income? Cause when I've, when I've tried it with uh, folks in my family, I, I have not been successful. Uh, well, yeah, we, usually we, uh, we try to point out that the economy is working very well for people with private jets and like the top corporations. It's like, there's the money in the 20 trillion of GDP for this. And also pointing out that it, it, it boosts tax revenues for states, you know, it'd be a mm -hmm. big boost. So, sometimes we just no don't, don't mention it because <laughs> it's like, well, people are going to vote for me as the democratic nominee. Uh, there's some people who would just vote because Michael Waltz is terrible. I mean, you would rather elect a chihuahua than him to Congress. And so we want to play to different constituencies, the aspects that are appealing to them. But when it comes up, because I've had criticism, even from people in Florida for Bernie, although they did endorse me, they're like, one was like, well, you're a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing because you are a li libertarian who supports tearing down social safety nets if you support the freedom dividend. I'm like, no, I, I, I support having it and a Green New Deal and universal health care. And I think we need to stop thinking about it as, oh, a zero sum game where if you take if you get one thing, you have to take away something else. Because, you know, when we come to like defense contractors or um you know, bailouts for the the top, I'll say 0.1% because sometimes people get upset that, oh, some people in the 1%, you know, look even higher than that for the very top people. <laughs> they have, we got plenty of money for them. So why is that, that we don't have it for hardworking people? Uh, and, and the idea that you have to earn your way with everything, you know, I, I'm a fan of personal responsibility and hard work. I, I, I think all, all nerds are, I mean, I'm a nerd, obviously, to get a PhD, uh, you, ha you have to be a nerd. <laughs> 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 but then at the same time, the deck is stacked against you. And I think I can segue to some of the reader comments mm -hmm. that I, I've been to uh, six Black Lives Matter rallies in Volusia County. Volusia County has a lot of Trump supporters. And so there are counter protesters that show up sometimes. Mm. But at the same time, we're seeing more support than you would expect uh, based on, you know, what I would have thought. Uh, with George Floyd, it kind of it highlighted what had already been going on but not filmed and sometimes it just wasn't as clear cut as that so let me say i don't want to trivialize anything but sometimes there'll be an excuse like well that guy had a phone in his hand it looked like a gun well with george floyd there was no way that you could say you know there's no way <laughs> to just it, it just you know it wasn't a split second decision it was nine minutes of, of torture and you know if we didn't have that young lady filming it it wouldn't have been probably as widely known so it's made a big difference i support police reform um as for defunding the police this has become a hot button word it's kind of like green new deal people just recoil they hear it but what it really means is putting more money in social services we need to restore federal oversight, demilitarize our police. It needs to stop being us versus them. And we need to have real justice. Because if you, you say no 
just no no justice, no peace. Because peace without justice is tyranny. I mean, you can have peace in in a an authoritarian society, but that is not freedom or liberty. That is uh, tyranny. What is the narrative that you hear from the counter protesters at the BLM protests? Like, what what is their yeah. argument? They don't really have much. I mean, they have the flags that say Trump 2020 because F you again. Like the, I, there was literally someone with a flag at a recent <laughs> one. I didn't go to that one, but I saw it on social media. That's that's it. Like that's all I got really. Uh, sometimes they'll be like, oh, we, you know, support the police. And they, they take it, the, the talking points they're getting from from Fox and say, oh, well, all of the states that have Democrats in charge are, you know, riots, looting, crime, failure. It's like, you know, if you if you do a little bit of critical thinking, you're going to find that it's a lot different than what you're saying. But, yeah, it's, it's typically stuff like that. You know, I, I don't understand it. Yeah, there is a great motivation within the MAGA community just to uh, to own the libs, I think they call it. Yeah, which is just to just to stick it to the libs, irrespective of any policy. It doesn't I know? Matter. I know. We have someone in, in not far from here. I live in an area with a lot of Trump supporters, and there's someone with a speedboat, Trump 2020, floating on liberal tears. It says, and I live yeah. next to a Democrat, so I put one of these on the neighbor's door because we have coronavirus, so we're just leaving these, you know, <laughs> the door mm -hmm. hangers. But uh, yeah, it, it, there's not a lot of policy, and you know they're lacking substance because when when what's his name, um, Sean Hannity asked Donald Trump, well, what's your plan for your second term? Mm. He didn't have anything. He said talent's very important to me, but experience, you know, he didn't know what to say. And you look at the Republican platform; they just copied the last one. Yeah. You know, they were going to have bullet points like they got nothing. It's terrible. It, it's it's the it's. It, unbelievable incompetence and i say i i'm a former republican i i had such a incongruence though to be a republican it's like well learning about you know i really became a big fan of elizabeth warren during my master's degree studying financial literacy and regulation mm -hmm. the consumer financial protection bureau and then i i had been indoctrinated by both of my parents actually believing that you know there's like illuminati uh the earth i didn't believe the earth was flat but my dad believes that but believing that, oh, climate change, you know, volcanoes, look, they put out more than humans. But then learning, well, wait a minute, there's that much, you know, CO2 in the air, and it wasn't ever that way before, and they've been measuring it since the 1950s in Hawaii. It's like, huh, you know, then eventually yeah. you come around. You kind of plant the seed in people's minds, and then they come around. I think a lot of people are going to be coming around. I'm still kind of flabbergasted that we're not gaining Democrats in this district. Republicans are still gaining on us. Mm. I don't know. I hope they vote for me. <laughs> we think that they will. But anyone who looks at this outside and say, oh, it's a long shot, you know, it's a big long shot. Um, I noticed my opponent, he did start putting out yard signs kind of early, the one in the, in the general, so the mm -hmm. incumbent Republican. Very close with Trump. I think he's Trump's favorite congressman. Trump came down for Daytona 500. The congressman is at the White House. He's been at Mar-a-Lago. He's been on Air Force One. He, mm. they, he flew down with Trump not once, but twice to Cape Canaveral for that manned uh, space flight launch, mm. you know, because it was scrubbed the first time. Uh, and he says you need to cut Social Security. He got booed in, in August of 2018 by a Republican primary audience, you know, the debate for the Republican primary for saying we need to have the guts to go up to Washington and get a hold of entitlement spending. But he, they, they voted for him anyway. So it's like, I think there'll be a change though. I'm hearing it. I just talked to a Republican two days ago. She said, we're tired of the Medicaid, you know, not being expanded in Florida. And we're only going to vote for candidates who are going to push to expand Medicaid. And so some people push back when I posted that, be like, that's not a federal issue. That's a state issue. I'm like, no, it is a federal issue, too, because you look, originally Medicaid was going to be tied to the existing Medicaid funding. And then in 2012, that got struck down, and nobody really believed states would actually turn away the federal money, because Florida could have got about $55 billion since January 1st, 2014, if mm -hmm. they expanded Medicaid. Another 800,000 people would be covered. It would be a big boost to our medical providers, our hospitals, our doctors, our nurses, having that steady stream of revenue, a big boost to public health, a big help with coronavirus, 
but you know we won't get it because the people in power here don't give any care to the needs of actual constituents and that's because you know there's issues with campaign finance uh we're always you know seeing that the republicans have no trouble getting hundreds of thousands of dollars um i, I know there's stuff across the aisle i don't want to be totally partisan at the same time i believe the democratic party is removing in the right direction um and the republican party is moving in the wrong direction and i think that's why andrew yang ran you know as well as a democrat what are your plans for daca yeah i want to support daca i think that you know what's the difference between i was born in daytona beach my mother fled china came to palo alto uh after tiananmen square and and then she moved to orlando and so if i was born in china and came here as a one-year-old how does that make me all that much different you know why should we be deporting people who are you know americans and often you find people know a lot about america who are you know from overseas they they really love the opportunity and the freedom that we have here when you look at the the constitution the thing the sort of things we value and protect that other countries don't so i i think that we should have amnesty for people here under the deferred um, action program. So let me um, challenge you on on that one. I, I, I also believe that we should have a path to citizenship for people who were brought here when they were very young. I also have to believe that there's finite resources that the country has and we have to have um, some immigration strategy. What are your thoughts on trying to preserve our country's role as this kind of melting pot and the city on a hill that attracts talent from all over the world. Um, but also with the realities that, you know, we don't have unlimited resources to provide to an unlimited number of people that want to come to this country. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't fully fleshed out everything in this. In Florida, we we don't have, uh, we're not a border state with Mexico per se. Or, but of course, we, we have to look at um, that the immigrants have a, a boost to us. I, I listen to Freakonomics a lot. I love that podcast and a few others. And they talk about, yes, it is, it can be when people immigrate into the country, a mild economic uh, negative for Americans already here, but it's a much bigger positive to those people coming here, especially when they're fleeing, like remain in Mexico has been a disaster for a lot of people. You know, they, people could go back to Mexico and end up being killed. And so you have to think, well, you know, we want to be that shining city on a hill and immigrants in a lot of ways are a great strength. Uh, so why, why, you know, are we, we're putting forced rhetoric that doesn't align. I would say with the numbers, you could at least restore the quotas to be what they were under the Obama administration. And, and there are people who say even those quotas, you know, were not high enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but now that they've been drastically cut on the number of people who can come over if they're fleeing, you know, there'll be climate refugees too. Uh, that's coming, but also all, all sorts of other issues and people coming here on work visas as well. Uh, but I, I just think that the way we're going about it is just, it, there's a lot more, the substance is paper thin in the arguments against it. Great. Well, Richard, uh, before we wrap up, I just wanted to make sure that we hit any other topics that are important to you that you wanted the audience to hear or any other information you want to share. Oh, of course. So um, I'll have a couple minutes here. Find mm -hmm. me online at thrip.com and it's right there. T-H-R-I-P-P. -P. A lot of people leave the H out and you can follow me online. Contribute to me. We're a grassroots campaign with, campaign with tons of volunteers. And so we need every dollar we can get because, you know, it's so difficult to make your way when you don't have big contributions from corporate interest. Uh, I, I point out another thing. Uh, we have, you know, uh, the money that's going in our economy is going to the top. So you look at the IRS and not a lot of people will say this. They are understaffed, underfunded. The tax gap is like $450 billion a year. They're not even auditing people who fail to file as top earners. So we need to restore our IRS. We need to restore our State Department too. When you look at the military, the Pentagon, $741 billion. And that's a bipartisan supported issue too. But we've let our State Department just wither away under Rex Tillerson was awful. And then Mike Pompeo, I mean, he's 
just as bad pretty much. And so my predecessor, Ambassador Nancy Soderberg, she would agree 100%. We need to put more in the diplomacy. And, and remember, American people are very charitable. You know, we're hard workers. We, we know how to make things work. You know, we know we're ingenious people and, and we're looked to as leaders worldwide. And so we just have to get back to that because right now things aren't looking too hot. Things aren't looking too good in this country. So I hope you'll vote for me if you happen to live in Volusia or Flagler or Lake or St. John's County of Florida. But if not, we want you on our team. So please get in touch. Uh, come online to thrip.com or send me an email to me at thrip.com. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Richard. And I, I hope uh, everybody uh, takes a look at thrip.com, checks you out. Uh, it would be fantastic to get another congressperson uh, on the, uh, the blue side of the aisle uh, in, in, uh, in November. And I really appreciate you also sharing your perspective as a former Republican. Uh, I think it represents kind of the diversity of the Yang gang and yeah. Uh, yeah. I hope, uh, hope people, uh, support you and can volunteer and get to know you more. And, and when's the big day for you? When's the, uh, I guess oh. the primary is coming up. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on Tom. And we definitely have a primary on August 18th. Early voting starts tomorrow. Uh, they'll probably delay it to the next day because we're being hit with a tropical storm imminently uh, in Flagler County. Early voting mm -hmm. starts tomorrow. And then Saturday, the 8th of August, we're going to win the primary. Like I'm 98% sure we're going to win the primary. And so then I'll be the Democratic nominee for this district, which is only an R plus seven. So you look at Oklahoma's fifth and look at Utah's fourth, much redder, flip blue in 2018. So we have a shot here and it's going to be huge. Like it's going to make national news, even with all the other stuff that's going to be going on around November 3rd. And we're very hopeful. And if not, we'll just start writing legislation anyway, and then we can give it to progressive members of Congress. And if you get in there, and UBI comes up. Will you support it? Yeah, 100%. Department yeah. of Technology, too. I, I signed the Humanity. <laughs> I was one of the first ones who signed the Humanity Ford Pledge. So I need your readers and listeners. I mean, not readers, but listeners <laughs> and, and viewers. Please help me to get more attention for Andrew Yang, because I think you know this is a great opportunity here. And my platform is pretty similar to Jen Perlman. Um, we'll see you know, what happens mm -hmm. with that. But it's it, here, it's a little different, because I have the Democratic Party support, because I'm going up against the Republican. And yeah. the guy I'm running against, they don't really like. He's uh, a four-time candidate. So if you're Yang Gang and you're you're liking what you hear from Richard, um, feel free to tweet out to Andrew and Humanity Forward that they should uh, consider endorsing him. Uh, as Richard points out, he will likely be the Democratic Party nominee in a Republican plus seven district. And that plus seven is probably melting away every day that Trump opens his mouth. <laughs> so yeah, this I is think, I think it is. I, I think it is. Yeah. I bet people are upset they didn't get in the race because I had been asking other people, you know, heavily funded people, if you run, I'm not going to run. And they're like, no, nah, have at it, kid. <laughs> so here we are. We're taking them down. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You you may have made this, this one of the smartest political moves uh, this this uh, this cycle. So. Best of luck to you, Richard. And with that, we'll say goodbye, nerds. Goodbye, nerds. Peace. All right, we are.